Good morning, everyone. Uh, always within the first sentence, you can probably tell where I'm from, some of you. I'm actually from the UK, but I'm actually Scottish, so I have quite a strong accent. And uh, English is also my second language. <laughs> some of you probably speak better English than me. But I'll be complimenting what Ashok said this morning already. I know Ashok well and his work. I've been uh, published it in my book and so on. But I want to take a slightly different perspective here. This AI stuff is both terribly thrilling and exciting, but also pretty frightening and scary at the same time. I'm sure you're sitting there going, wow, is this really the future here? At the same time going, really, can we implement this? Can we do this in our institutions? But I'm going to push the boat a little bit and test a hypothesis, which is how far you can push this AI in teaching and learning thing based on learning theory. In other words, what do we know about how people learn and how does that inform what we do with this uh, bright future? Now, when I used to, uh, I actually gave a keynote at EduLearn in 2015 uh, talking about AI. So I've been working in this like Ashok for many, many years since I was a student, in fact, way back at Dartmouth when I first came across this when I was 19 and implemented many systems and so on. I just noticed there, actually, I'm wearing exactly the same shirt as I <laughs> my wife. I have no sense of fashion whatsoever. I'm not interested. But that was 2015. But then suddenly, this thing exploded. Now, when I used to give talks back then in AI, I used to give an example, because this is what AI used to be for us in teaching and learning. I would describe it as an idiot savant. In other words, it was a really smart, but really stupid at the same time. It was really good at doing very precise things, but pretty bad at being general, or a teacher, or a normal human being. And I used to give the example of my Roomba, which is the first real robot that was useful in my house, and that was something that sweeps up all the dust, so it goes around the whole of the bottom floor of my house. Fantastic machine. If it comes to the edge, it reverses. If it runs out of electricity, it goes and plugs itself back in. This is a pretty smart machine, and it has a mental map, which is AI-driven, of the bottom of my house. But I also have a dog. This is actually my dog. I love my dog, Doug. And if he does his business in the carpet in my house, the Roomba will come out and smear it mathematically literally into every corner of the room. And that's what I used to call the idiot savant model of AI. But of course, something changed. And uh, during COVID, I got my head down and became like a monk and started writing books. I was always blogging and really mostly online in my communications. And I first wrote uh, out these books here. I really, this one in learning technology focused on the big picture of learning technology because we've had learning technology for most of our sort of evolution, as it were, you know, if you go into the caves of Altamira in Spain, you will see how sophisticated that was as a learning experience. But we also have to inform what we do in technology with learning theory. Now, don't for one minute imagine that the old existing system is informed by learning theory. There is almost nothing in learning theory that says we should slab out lectures three times a week for students. The lecture, we only have the one-hour lecture because the Sumerians had a base 60 number system. There's absolutely nothing in the literature that says this is an optimized system of learning. There is absolutely nothing in the literature that says your only means of assessment should be an essay. We have an incredibly primitive set of assumptions in learning theory in the existing system anyway. Like Ashok, I think we're on the threshold of massively improving both our application of learning theory as well as the types of systems we want to produce going forward. And as I say, you know, I wrote this book on learning technology because I think, I really do believe that since we made those first marks on shelves half a million years ago, when we externalized our knowledge, made it something in the world outside of our brains, we then came along and in the caves of Altamira in France, you can see it there. Those were learning experiences. Those were hunter-gatherers, and they came together socially, just as you have here in Palma. They came together socially, 
because they needed to know two things. What are on the walls of those caves in Altamira? I've been in those caves. They are astonishing. There's only two things, animals that will kill you and animals that you have to kill to survive. It was a learning experience. It was a simulator. All those handprints on the wall that they blew using ochre, those were young people's handprints. There are no pictures of plants. There are no pictures of anything other than things that would kill you and things you had to kill. It was an intense learning experience. Then we have writing. I think we've maybe got carried away with writing a little bit. We now send kids to school at age five, and for the next 20 years, by and large, they read and write text. This model is completely unacceptable to me now. The older I get, the more foolish this model seems. We judge them in text. Most degrees, you sit for one exam. You did what I did when I have a degree in philosophy. I memorized eight essays, memorized them, got a good degree. It's what every student has done for decades. No critical thinking whatsoever in the assessment. And we think that's acceptable. I don't think it is. Then we have printing, textbooks, which reinforced the text view of education in many ways, which I think was a good thing, but a double-edged sword as well. Computers and AI come along, suddenly it comes back out again and stretches before us. Suddenly we can look at the skills side that Ashok was mentioning. And perhaps that's a good thing. Because something extraordinary happened on the 30th of November 2022. It shocked almost all of us who were working in AI at the time. And that is that AI suddenly got super good. It was a massive leap in functionality with ChatGPT. Massive leap in functionality. Two million people, you talk about student or learner engagement, two million people adopted this technology within a day. Sorry, one million within two days. Within two months, you're up to 100 million. You now have hundreds of millions of people using this tool, and what are they using it for? They're using it to help them in their job. They're using it to learn. Institutions are being bypassed, in a sense, by this technology because it seems so powerful. It seems to blow your mind when you first use this thing. It's so incredibly useful. So I don't think student engagement is such a problem. But there's also maybe a misapprehension about AI. As Ashok said, it's not one thing. There's more to AI than just generative AI. But generative AI, to stick to this for a moment, is an astounding thing for the following reason. It has gathered that the sum of human knowledge, all of that text that we've been producing, writing was only invented four times in the history of our species, in Egypt, Mesopotamia, China, and Mesoamerica, only four times. But it led to an explosion of cultural archiving. All of that stuff has been gathered up and put into the model, used to train the model with additional human training. So when we use ChatGTP, when we speak to it or have dialogue with it, we're having dialogue with ourselves. It's not really a machine, it's actually a language within a machine, and that's us. It's not something else, it's not a database. This is not sampling. It's actually us having a real dialogue, and that's what shocks us about this technology when we first come across it. And if you were to read the text upon which ChatGPT 3.5 was trained, it would take you 22,000 years reading eight hours a day. This is why this technology will be smarter than any teacher historically, smarter than any human being. It already is in that sense. It knows more than anybody in this room or any single human being on the planet when it comes to knowledge. Of course, there are other things that it needs to know. And I think Bill Gates really hit the nail on the head for me when he wrote this article a few weeks ago. There's a lot of noise about the ethics of AI, but Bill Gates said something very interesting, that the two big beneficiaries of AI will be number one, learning and education. Number two, healthcare. And I agree with him wholeheartedly. I was in Senegal four weeks ago, and if you go to places where they don't have a roof in the classroom, there was a school there that didn't have chairs in the classroom. It's all very well being very European, North American about your ethics and AI, but think for a moment about the benefits that are possible for everybody else in the world who have no chance of going into higher education. It's a sobering experience. 
And the truth of the matter is, the productivity increases that almost everybody feels when they use this tool for the first time, generative AI, chat GPT, is that you get this sort of blue line effect. You can suddenly do in a few minutes what took you hours before, that report, that email, that essay for students. Suddenly you can do things in minutes, seconds that took hours before. This is a massive increase in productivity. Now, this will have a massive increase in the workplace. You will see an amazing effect on productivity because of these tools. This is why we can't ignore it as educators. If it's going to completely revolutionize the nature of work, it would be idiotic of us to ignore it in education. In fact, we have been ignoring it because for the last 20 years, all your learners have been using it nearly every day anyway. When I was in Stanford and we split the audience of students and it's in the medical faculty, students and faculty on one side, and we asked the students how they learned and we asked faculty how they learned, it was a sobering experience. The students had about 15 tools they used, mostly online, tools like Picmonic and so on that faculty had never heard of. The assumption was it was lectures and teaching. The students were going, not really, not really because they were increasingly switching online. The number two was YouTube and Google. Now, Google is an AI system. Actually, when you search for a YouTube video, you're using AI. If you use Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, any piece of social media, it's mediated by AI. If, like me, you watched a ton of stuff on Netflix or the Disney Channel or Prime, that interface was mediated by AI. Your viewing habits were influenced by AI. You might not think it, but the data would suggest this is true. Now, sticking to work before we come to learning for a minute, the studies are already coming out on increased productivity in the workplace. I particularly like this study from MIT because they measured two things. Does it increase productivity in terms of time saved? So a student wants an essay to write. Well, they get the bulk of the basic stuff done by chat GT, uh, GPT. It saves them hours of time. That's obvious, time saving. What about quality, though? Because we're in the quality game in education. It turns out that there's a significant increase in quality as well, because you're taking away all that laborious stuff. When I was a student and I did a PhD, I spent about six months of my life walking up and down library shelves looking for journals. It was absurd, absolutely absurd. You can now find those in a second. I personally think you should take six months off every single PhD time now. If we were rational beings in higher education, we would do that, but of course we're not rational at all. The truth is there are massive increases in time saving already for the last 20 years in the learning game because of Google and other tools. Now, here's a rather worrying thing. My favorite paper on predicting what will happen in the employment market was actually published by OpenAI. It's very detailed and very data driven. But look at the headline here. If you went to college, GPT will come for your job first. That's an astounding statement. It's the reverse of what we've been taught for the last 50 years. The last 50 years is go to college, get a good job. Actually, we assumed that all those poor people in the world, all their jobs doing those repetitive physical tasks would be automated by robots, and we would be king of the hill because we've got degrees. Turns out to be the very opposite. We found that during COVID. Those people who kept us alive, the nurses, the doctors, the delivery drivers, the people who kept your lights on and so on, their jobs aren't being automated anytime soon. The truth of the matter is that those people with moderate degrees who have really been focusing just on text and been assessed through text, through essay writing, are actually the people who are perhaps most at threat here. This is a complete turnout, a flip, a reversal, if you wish. And it worries me this, it worries me because I think, I, I'm you know, 66 years old, and when I reflect on the political situation, it worries me that we have a graduate class that's separated from the working class in my country. That's certainly true, it led to Brexit. Uh, look at what's happening in France, look what's happening in America, look what's happening throughout Europe. If you don't think this separation of the graduate class looking down upon the rest of the world is a bad thing, maybe you have to think again, because maybe like Paris, your city will be burnt down soon. This is not a trivial issue, this. It's a serious issue. But let me 
lighten the mood a little. <laughs> I was getting a bit political there. Let's look at uh, learning theory and how this affects all this stuff. Now, traditionally, AI was really, in, really built on the back of two and a half thousand years of mathematics. The first algorithm was by Euclid, top left-hand corner here. We then have the application of logic or syllogistic logic through Aristotle. Uh, we have al Khwarizmi, the great Arab scholar, who gave us that Greek stuff. That's where the word algorithm comes from, al Khwarizmi. Uh, we have people like Pascal. We have a whole load of statistical and probability theorists, Cardano, Bernoulli, especially in Europe. Uh, and then we have the bottom two who are really significant, Boole, who gives us Boolean logic, and lastly, Bayes. You've probably never heard of Bayes, but without Bayes, there is no Google. Uh, fundamentally, page rank was a little Bayesian equation. You could write it on your thumb, and it created one of the most valuable countries in the world. So it was all mathematics, algorithms, probability, statistics. Uh, but then something interesting happened in the 20th century. We had some very bright sparks, starting with a guy called Donald Hebb. Hebb was a Canadian teacher and headmaster. And he suddenly saw amongst his students that they were learning very well if you give them a breadth of subjects. And the more you exposed learners to a breadth of experiences, the smarter they became. So he looked inside the brain and went, oh, well, that's interesting. The brain's made of neurons. Perhaps it's the neurons and the network of neurons that really is fundamental to learning. It turned out to be right. And then we have the famous, famous phrase from Hebb, or Hebbian learning, which is uh, neurons that fire together, wire together. It was an insight that the network capability of the brain was the really important thing here. Then along come two really smart people, uh, Warren McCulloch, who was a neuroscientist interested in the brain, Walter Pitts, who was a pure mathematician, rather unusual, very eccentric man, he actually was homeless when uh, Warren McCulloch came upon him. And they built a mathematical model of the neuron, <laughs> which included logical operators like and, or, and not, and so on. So suddenly you have this, you know, learning theory hits maths. This proved to be incredibly fruitful. And along comes a real genius, my favorite person in this list, Frank Rosenblatt, who builds a thing called the perceptron. And this is actually a real machine, and it looks at you, and it tries to establish whether you're a human being, or a cat, or a dog, or a leopard, and actually worked. For the first time, he took the modeling which these people had given him and built a machine that learns, that learns. That's the important point. Then with Alan Turing, and then Demis Hassabis, who's the head of DeepMind, really the driving force in Google now. Demis was also a learning theorist. He actually went back into academia, incredibly smart guy, chess prodigy, games designer, built companies, went back into academia and published some significant papers on the nature of memory in the hippocampus and learning. So suddenly we're getting this mixture of learning theory and maths all feeding into AI. All of these people are AI focused. And then we have the three people at the bottom here who have the Nobel Prize in AI, backpropagation, all those sort of technical terms, all invented by these people. And suddenly we have deep learning. We have a machine that learns. We also have a machine that teaches. That's a key and separate point. Now, if you go back into learning theory, and I've spent all my life writing about these people, mainly because when I came into the learning world, I found it. Like, if you speak to an engineer, they will know physics. <laughs> if you're going to build a bridge, I would expect you to know physics. It would seem in the learning game you can spend 30 or 40 years teaching without knowing any learning theory whatsoever. <laughs> or you know something like Bloom's Triangle or Abraham Maslow's Pyramid. Bloom never had a triangle in his life, never wrote it. It's actually a caricature of learning theory. And indeed, his pupil completely dismissed it. But still, that's the thing we get captured in our training in this area. But if you look at those people, and I've put them in a whole load of podcasts as well, let's ask ourselves a serious question. AI can obviously learn, but can it teach? Can it teach? And I have, for the first time in my life, I've been in technology and learning for 40 years, for the first time ever, I see on the horizon the possibility of an AI teacher. I would never have said this was possible before. I think it is possible now. Not now, but it's coming soon. First, our world was really simple in the past. Teachers and learners, really simple in schools and higher education. Suddenly, 
along came an AI learner, all that technology I've just described to you. Suddenly, we have a machine that learns, but we also have teachers, such as the one that Ashok built on top of his system. We suddenly have a teacher that teaches using the AI system. Actually, the AI learning thing is getting smarter and smarter and smarter and bigger and bigger and bigger all the time. The teachers, therefore, get better. Ashok has just shown you that. But the teachers, human teachers, are exactly the same. In actual fact, if you teach, if you're a member of faculty or in the school, you sort of get a plateau effect. Your effectiveness as a teacher raises quite dramatically over the first two years, then sort of plateaus and flattens off. And the problem you have in higher education is scale. When I went to university, only 10% of the population in the UK went to university, and now it's 50%. In the US, it's 60, 70%. But it hasn't scaled. This is why you're struggling with assessment. This is why GPT has blown the lid off, because you're stuck with an old form of assessment, old forms of teaching that don't scale. If you are going to scale, you will have to use this technology, because the truth of the matter is, we are now, I think, looking at the possibility of eliminating the teacher. This will not come as bad news to all my academic friends. My friend Paul, professor of philosophy, uh, world expert in Hume, hasn't taught for years. And like all of the academics I know, he never wanted to teach in the first place. He wanted to do research. And this is fundamental to the model in higher education. But the truth, the real truth here, an uncomfortable truth, is that teaching is not a high priority for many or most in higher education, I would claim. Now, what's the role of dialogue and conversation in learning? That's an interesting question from the learning theory point of view. And I think we really have to think about evolution here. It didn't take us any effort at all to learn our first language. So we can speak to each other, and we can listen to each other. It was like falling off a log. It wasn't a teaching experience. We didn't have to go to school to learn our first language. But it takes years to read and write, years to learn to read and write, because that brain inside your skull there, which sleeps eight hours a day, has a very fallible long-term memory, very limited. Your working memory can only hold three or four things in, in your head at one time. So if I ask you to add 11 plus 13 plus 7, you'll manage that. But if I go, what's 11 plus 17 plus 54 plus 94 plus 16 plus 5, you'll struggle. The human brain is in a remarkably limited thing, which means teaching is really hard. And you will forget almost everything I have just said today. If you don't take notes, you will absolutely, it's pure science from Ebbing House onwards. 130 years of research shows that you will have forgotten everything I've said if you don't take notes. Notes will increase your attention by 20 to 30%. That's why teaching, by and large, fails, which is why you could barely go back and pass your exams again. And David Geary, uh, a real genius in this area. His book, The Origin of the Mind, is really useful here. He says that motivation and control, the stuff Ashok was talking about there, all that metacognition thing, is sort of determined by your evolutionary past, which is why attention, why you, over the next two days, you will struggle to hold your, I can barely do it now, I'm an adult. I, can, I can't do what you do, sit in an auditorium and listen for hours and hours to people. We didn't evolve to do this. We evolved to speak to each other and have dialogue, and hopefully you'll get lots of that going forward. Primary learning involves a different type of interface. It involves dialogue, it involves speech. Oracy is terribly important, and we've sort of eliminated that from higher education in schools, which I think is a shame. It also means a change in interface design. You know all that hokey e-learning stuff that we've inflicted on people for so many years now? Text, graphic, text, graphic, multiple choice question. Ask somebody in a bar what they think of that, and the reaction is usually a roll of the eyes. You know that Disneyfication of learning, all those stupid cartoons with little speech bubbles. What does Peter think of the Data Protection Act? Click on the speech bubble. People hate that stuff because there's no real dialogue. It's really souped up PowerPoint. Now, we have tools. The three big ones, of course, that are available now. The first one is ChatGPT, which is available to everybody for free. That's at least three. Then you have Bing from Microsoft. Here's a little tip, by the way. If you sign up for Bing, you get ChatGPT4 for free. Normally, you have to pay $20 for it, so you get it for free. And then there's Bard. Although, if you're in Europe, you will not get Bard. UK, OK, because the, the Google have refused to go into Europe because of the threat of regulation. It's another question. Now, dialogue on Socrates, 
People often say, well, can you think of the learning theories that are in dialogue? And the first name that comes up in Socrates, I'm not sure that Socrates is that useful here, actually, because there are two Socrates. There's the Socrates of Plato, who is a very fine, giving birth to the student's thought, open questioning type Socrates. And then there's the Socrates of Xenophon, and I think actually he's nearer the mark, because Socrates was a bit of a bully, a sort of hair-splitting, abstract thinker. And if you've ever read the dialogues like the Theaetetus, which is the one that's most pertinent to learning in uh, epistemology, he's brutal with the people he speaks to. And of course, we don't really know this Socrates, it's really Plato. So I'm not so sure that the Socratic method is such a great method to follow here. Uh, but you can certainly ask ChatGPT what they think of it, and they give him a glowing review. What's far more relevant are some of the people you might never have heard of. So we have Gordon Pask, who came up with the ecological theory, which you may have seen that one of uh, uh, Ashok's slides there, the ecological view of learning, which is quite important here. He was called the dandy of cybernetics, a phrase I absolutely love. He was a really eccentric guy, uh, you know, had a pipe, uh, a cape, a bow tie a difficult guy in many ways. But what he studied was conversation theory. And he didn't mean simply dialogue, me speaking to you, me, you speaking to me. He meant the internal dialogue you have when you learn. So when a student is sitting, if you're sitting here, you'll often be going, ah, no, that's not right. That's bullshit, what Donald just said. You have an internal dialogue in your phonological loop. He meant conversation in the widest sense of the world, dealing with the world, solving problems, all the things that Ashok referred to. And he built machines. We've forgotten about those machines. He built machines very early that did this. But his conversational theory proves to be incredibly useful when you're building these systems. What about engagement and personalization in learning? I think maybe the premise behind Ashok's argument there was that personalization is the big deal here. And I wholly agree with this. Don't worry about engagement. In fact, I hate the word engagement in learning. I love stand-up comedy, and I go to the Edinburgh Festival every year, and I've listened to hundreds of stand-up comedians. I was massively engaged. Can't remember a single joke. Not one. Engagement is a terrible proxy for learning because you can be engaged but not learning. I've just given you an example. How many of you can actually remember all the movies and box sets you watched during COVID? None of us, none of us, in one eye out the other. You can be engaged, but going through things you already know. We actually, students quite like that. They like the familiar, what they already know. They feel comforted by that. You can actually do harm in learning. It's another interesting area studied by people like Bjork and others. But uh, be very careful with that word engagement. I much prefer, also the word fun, I don't like in learning very much. Learning is not fun, it shouldn't be. That sounds like an odd thing to say, but the research would suggest that that's a really terrible proxy for learning as well. And have a look at Desi and Ryan's self-determination theory. The really important things in learning are some of the things that Ashok referred to, autonomy. The learner has to feel in control of the learning experience. That's what gives them motivation and that's what drives them forward, gives them momentum. A second thing is the feeling that they're increasing competence, that they've learned something they're improving. That's really important. It's quite deep, but it's what gives you intrinsic motivation. And a third one is the social dimension. Terribly important as well. And then, of course, myself and Ashok wholly agree in Benjamin Bloom, except for that daft pyramid or the stupid pyramid, which is the bit of Benjamin Bloom that everybody picks up and is the most useless piece of Bloom imaginable. But he has two things that he has to teach us. One is time to competence. This is a really important thing. So we're obsessed by limiting time for learning in higher education in schools. You will sit that exam at the end of the year. If you fail it, you will have to wait a whole year to resit the exam. How stupid is that? How stupid is that? And then the truth, the truth of the matter is, learners are not either good or bad. We still have this sort of view that we just have good and bad learners. Actually, learners are just a bit faster or a bit slower which is why personalization matters. Allow students to take as long as they need to pass the damn thing. Why are you limiting it by time all the time? Because we like timetabling. We are going on our holidays in the summer. We close down our institutions three or four times a year for weeks on end. What sort of model is that? Nobody else does this in the real world. The second one is the Two Sigma paper. If there's only one paper you really should read, it's this one in online learning, because it says it all. One-to-one -one tuition works. It's as simple as that. 
And uh, when you set out to build these systems, it's incredibly difficult. And I did this precisely way back, started 2013, break down all your knowledge in mathematics, statistics, give learners different vectors through the content. If they get stuck, you know, when I was a child at home, both my, both my parents left school at 16. We didn't have a single book in our house. If I got stuck in mathematics at home and homework, that was it. I was stuck. End of story. It's not true now. You can bridge that gap because there are smart systems that get you through that process. And does it work? Well, we had the Bill Gates Foundation funding this to $2 million at ASU. Boy, does it work. So those 101 courses in your institutions, statistics, biology, writing, maths, the things that t kids often fail at, you see significant increases in attainment and therefore falls in dropout rates, which is a big problem, especially in the US. So 20% increase in improvement in pass rates, 50% reduction in fallout just by personalizing the learning. And then, of course, we have some really interesting things happening since November can mingle. If you work in a school, then you will be able to bring personalization to the kids in that school. And in subjects like maths and physics, where most children fail catastrophically, you will get them through that pain barrier using this stuff. But what about the role of language in learning? So we've covered engagement, we've covered dialogue. What about the role of language here? And I really like the work here of Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein looks at language and thinking. When you use one of these models, chat GPT, it seems quite human. You can ask it to be a pirate. I was in Greece recently, I came back and started asking it to speak to me in the voice of Homer. It was absolutely astonishing. And that's because it captures what Wittgenstein called language games. I'm standing here now talking to you and I'm playing a sort of language game. I'm being quite didactic, forceful, blah, blah, blah. If I was in a bar in Palma and I met you for the first time, I'd be playing a completely different language game. Where are you from? Oh, really interesting. Blah, 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 blah. We play language games. Now, what these big language models do is capture language games. They capture the didactic teaching language game. They capture the dialogue language game, all those different forms of teaching. That's why you can get it to be a good teacher almost from the word go. I want you to be a tutor. Tell me about quantum mechanics. And it actually starts to talk like a tutor and take you through the stuff step by step. So language games, there are also limits to language. Wittgenstein thought we should stop moralizing and using language to be amateur ethicists which, of course, is a big deal in the AI world. And then we have a huge hero of mine, Vygotsky, Lev Vygotsky, 30s in Soviet Russia. He actually looks at language and learning, and a really important figure here, because he discovers something really, really quite interesting. That intelligence, language is not a function of intelligence. It's the other way around. We're intelligent because we have language. Intelligence is a function of language, not the other way around. And he absolutely kills Piaget stone dead on his child development theory by showing that it's language, not by teachers, of course, language from your parents and your peers that really matter as you develop as a child and become a learner. But he has three other concepts that are important in terms of AI in learning. One is the concept of the knowledgeable other. In other words, it's actually quite good to have a teacher. Sometimes you need guided learning in life. That can be a parent, it can be your brother, it can be an uncle, it can be anybody, it can be a teacher, it can be an academic. But that knowledgeable other has to use language. It's called mediation. We won't go into detail there. But a really interesting point he makes that almost everybody has forgotten is he mentions the word tools. He thinks that mediation can take place through tools. Then he didn't have any computers, but now we do. We have AI. We have a tool that is a teacher. It can actually teach you. So it's entirely in line with Vygotsky's learning theory. What about the role of emotions? That's often this form of human exceptionalism. I'm not so, <laughs> you know, all my life, you know, human exceptionalism, we had Copernicus who suddenly threw us out from being the center of the universe to a little rock going around the sun. We had Darwin who then told us we were really just an animal like all other animals. And we're holding desperately on to these pieces of human Abilities like 21st century skills or critical thinking, thinking that we are unique. Well, maybe not. And one of those is emotions. But it's an interesting one because there are many people who have researched the issue of emotion and learning, and it's important, it's critical. 
The first is Nassan Reeves, who in 35 studies in a brilliant book showed that we all regard technology as a bit human. You know that feeling when your car breaks down, you want to kick it because it seems as though it has agency when it doesn't? Well, that's the way we react to computers. So Wozniak and Steve Jobs, when they brought the first, when Wozniak brought the first Apple computer out, put it on the desk, showed it to Steve Jobs, and it was a little blinking cursor. And Steve Jobs said, well, why hasn't it said hello? And Wozniak, who's a technical guy, said, well, it's a computer. Why would you want it to say hello? Who was right? Steve Jobs was right, which is why Apple's one of the most important companies in the world. He was right because computers are read as being almost human by us. We expect them to behave like humans, to say hello, goodbye, be polite. First impressions really matter, which is why I hate learning programs that say, and the learning objectives of this course will be. And <laughs> who does that? All that old training speak. Who does that these days? Imagine going onto a website, imagine going to the cinema. You're sitting in an auditorium like this, the film Titanic comes up on the screen, and it says the objectives of this film are that a boat leaves Southampton, 1,500 people drown, but we'll throw some romance in to keep you interested. And you go, what are you doing? <laughs> and yet educators do this all the time. Actually, it kills and bores people if that's your first event, which is the very opposite of what you want to do in terms of attention. Experts matter. There are all sorts of really interesting studies in this one. But emotions, as studied by all of these people, in education really does matter. And it matters in an interesting way. But does it matter if the emotion is expressed by a machine? That's an interesting question. And this study, which has come out this year, tried this out. In other words, when you go to the doctor, they compared chat, oh, chat GPT, in fact, with a doctor, and it came out with an astonishing result. 79% of patients, and this was the very early version of ChatGPT, preferred the chatbot. But what was more interesting was why they preferred the chatbot. They preferred it because it showed more empathy. That, to me, was bizarre. <laughs> Better quality of advice, also empathy. Now, imagine a future. When you go into the doctor presently, they have a 5% misdiagnosis rate. One in 20 of you will be misdiagnosed. Imagine if an AI doctor brought that down to 2%. Why would you go to a doctor? If you're my age, the big misdiagnosis is between reflux uh, uh, from food coming up from your stomach and a heart problem. And if you get that misdiagnosis, you will die. It's a worrying thing. But imagine, take that argument over into teaching. Supposing this AI becomes such a good teacher that it's better than any teacher, it knows more than any teacher, it gives endlessly patient, benevolent, friendly, helpful, supportive. Why would you want the human teacher? Teaching is only a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. I think we often think that teaching is an end in itself. But the end is improvement, cognitive improvement in the learner. Now, we saw that thing at the beginning there on emotion, you know, of the, the, the synthesia type figure that Antonio showed at the beginning of the person who wasn't a person at all, it was captured in AI. And I went through, I wish I could show you my AI avatar this week, but I did it last week. So you go in, you've got green screen behind you, you, you do all your eye movements, your head movements, your gestures, and it captures Donald. So I now have a second Donald, God forbid, as my wife said. But a... Uh, that will be quite prevalent in the near future. But that has implications in teaching. Supposing that that avatar can express all those emotions. This is my son, by the way. And you can just do this for free on the internet if you go to my heritage thing. That is just a still photograph. In about three minutes of processing, you can download it on your smartphone again. You know, you can suddenly get facial gestures and all sorts of things done here. This is, his grand this is my grandfather, his great-grandfather, we only have one photograph of this guy. He fought all the way through the First and Second World War as a professional soldier. Didn't talk about the war at all. And we put this picture in. And it was a really moving moment for, I have two sons. You know, this is, this is a guy they had never met. We have one photograph of him. And it gave us a little sense of him. My, one, one of my sons, my other son, actually looks a bit like him. And of course, you can create these videos, and I did that last week and we'll be using that with a major publisher to front the sort of content which they use and all that stuff. You can see why a universal teacher is moving on quite quickly here. 
you can actually, for $145, take your smartphone, do three minutes of video, speak 100 sentences into your smartphone, send that file off to Tencent, like Chinese Google, and they will send you back a photorealistic, moving, talking avatar of yourself for 145 bucks. This is moving very, very quickly indeed. But can AI really have empathy or feelings? Well, the answer is no. It can't feel that. There's no neurophysiological basis for feeling it. But it can recognize them. It can recognize them. And in some cases, it's superior to the human recognition of emotion in the learner. Because we have things like facial expressions, obviously, voice, intonation, body language, biometrics, all that sort of stuff. It's getting very, very good indeed at reading emotion, which is what you need as a teacher. If you've ever taught young 16-year-olds who don't want to learn maths, you'll know exactly what I mean. You're constantly reading the room and reading their faces to see who's going to upset the class next. And of course, we have things like sentiment analysis and all sorts of things, AI techniques. And LLMs are quite good at this, by and large. But they can also display emotion. We saw those avatars at the beginning here. They were looking as though they were real people and had emotions. They didn't, of course. It's just a piece of AI-generated video. Because they can display body language. They can display eye movements. They can display all of those things. We're all trapped solipsistically. We don't read other people's minds. We read their behaviors, their eyes, their faces, their gestures. And technology can start to do this. But only if we move from 2D to 3D will this really become massive and fully effective. And that's where we come to uh, Papert here, who co-founded the MIT lab, a big AI guy. And he believed, along with many other people, that we have to move from 2D to 3D. You're all 3D people. We're in a 3D building. I'm 3D. And we teach and learn in 2D. Flat PowerPoint, flat e-learning, flat video, flat books, flat everything. And the truth of the matter is it's not enough. Context really matters in learning. So if I split you in half here, this half study and sit the exam in the same room, this half study in the hotel and come and sit the exam in this room, this group will have higher marks. Study 1940s, OK? An interesting variation on that study was the second one. Let's suppose we go down to the beach, and I put you, this side of the room, into a scuba diving set. I send you to the bottom of the ocean where you learn some stuff. You guys stay on the beach, and you learn some stuff. Suppose I split you half, and half you then go underwater, and then the scuba divers, half of them come onto the beach. The people who do best are the people who both learn and sit the exam below the water, or learn and both sit the exam on the beach, because context always matters. You can even do it by drunk students. So you can take, we'll get you all drunk and wine in town. You learn some stuff, try and sit the exam. You stay sober. We swap you around. The people who learn while sober and pass the exam do well. The people who stay drunk and pass the exam well. The people who mix it up don't. Now, it's so obvious in a way, isn't it, that almost all the skills that Ashok talked about are not being taught in universities. <laughs> the main skills being taught in universities are, in fact, text analysis and production. And so this is happening now, and it's happening because AI is driving the 3D world. AI is producing avatars, environments, objects, learning content, learning pathways. All the wonderful stuff that Ashok is doing is now being driven by this. And will we have a universal teacher in learning? I think the answer is almost certainly now yes. It's a hard thing to stomach in a way because there are big moral implications in this, but I think it's true because you can build the pedagogy as Ashok has done into the models themselves, into the AI itself. And if you don't think this is happening, Harvard's most popular course, CS50 course on basic computer science and programming is going to be delivered by AI this fall. Okay, so it's both thrilling but terrifying. Thank you very much for speaking. Thank you.